Good evening and welcome. It is time once again for CU Immigration here on WRFU LP Urbana, 104.5 FM. I will be your host for this evening. My name is Mr. Garza and I'm here to let you know that WRFU is an open forum for the Urbana Champaign community. Views expressed are those of the speakers and are not intended to represent WRFU or UCIMC or, as we like to say on this show, uh, UPTV, because we also film this and, um, sorry, <laughs> something on my screen and, um, broadcasted it on UPTV. So yeah, so there you go. So that's all the disclaimer you're going to get. Uh, be aware that I express a lot of opinions in the show and also the, you know, there are opinion, opinions, of course, embedded in any news article that I might happen to read. So, without further ado, uh, let us begin. I'm going to start with just sort of an odd place to get an article. WebMD. I mean, how many times have you looked up some strange symptom and decided that you, you're dying any day now? Chances are you probably saw <laughs> a lot of that on WebMD. Anyway, they have a story here about immigrants, so I thought I would read it because it's, you know, who knows? WebMD Health News. And this is entitled, Immigrants Healthier Than Native Born But Advantage Fades. Hmm. So immigrants to the U.S. are healthier and have better health outcomes on average than native born Americans, according to a new study in the journal Health Affairs. But the longer that immigrants live in the U.S., the more their health profiles resemble those of the native born. These findings are among a wealth of details about immigrants' self-reported health and access to health care included in the study. The researchers analyzed data from two large surveys, one national and the other focused only on California. The latter survey was used because it included data on undocumented immigrants that was lacking in the national poll. Four groups of adult immigrants were compared to native-born adults, naturalized citizens, non-citizen immigrants in the U.S. for more than five years, non-citizen immigrants here for five years or less, and undocumented immigrants. Self-reported health status among naturalized immigrants, who by definition must be in the country for at least five years, was similar to that of citizens born in the U.S., the study found. In contrast, a higher share of non-citizen immigrants who have been in the U.S. for more than five years, or 30.1%, and who had been in the U.S. for five years or less, 41.6%, had excellent health compared with U.S.-born adults, 27.1%. Hmm. Both naturalized and non-citizen immigrants had lower rates of high blood pressure, heart disease, arthritis, asthma, and mental conditions compared with U.S.-born adults, but naturalized citizens were more likely than the native-born to have type 2 diabetes. Hmm. The story was different for undocumented people. In the California survey, twice as many undocumented immigrants reported being in fair or poor health than native-born citizens. And only 29.3% of the undocumented say, said they were in very good or excellent health compared to 54.2% of native-born Californians. In the national survey, the non-citizen adult immigrants were considerably younger on average than the U.S.-born adults, which partially explains their better health status. In addition, the study notes chronic conditions are likely to be underdiagnosed among underserved immigrants because of poor access to health care. Arturo Vargas Bustamante, Ph.D., Professor of Health Policy and Management at UCLA's Fielding School of Public Health and the paper's lead author, told WebMD that a third reason for the disparity between the health status of immigrants and native-born populations is the healthy immigrant effect. What this means is that people who choose to face the rigors and challenges of emigrating to a foreign nation tend to be stronger physically and mentally than other people from their home country. The biggest reason for the narrowing of differences in health status between immigrants and native-born Americans over time, Bustamante explains, is the aging of immigrants, which is linked to the same kinds of health problems that people born in this country have as they enter middle age. In addition, he says, exposure to the U.S. lifestyle can harm immigrants' health. 
in their native countries, they might have walked to work or used public transportation. Here, they drive a car, he notes. They get hungry at night and start eating fast food because it's convenient. So the process of integrating into the U.S. society also comes with the process of assuming the American lifestyle and behavior. Finally, he observes, many immigrants live in low-income areas where there are food deserts, environmental hazards, and poor access to health care. The longer they live in this country, the more exposed they are to these social detriments of health, he says. Compared with 11.4% of U.S.-born adults who lacked health insurance, uninsured rates were 12.3% among naturalized immigrants, 43% among non-citizen immigrants in the U.S. for more than five years, and 36.4% among non-citizen immigrants in this country for five years or fewer. Although the Affordable Care Act made more legally authorized immigrants eligible for health care and allowed more of them to have insurance coverage, it left out undocumented immigrants. Unsurprisingly, 45% of undocumented people in the California survey were uninsured. More non-citizen immigrants who have been in the U.S. for at least five years, 12.3%, were covered by Medicaid than non-citizen immigrants who had been here for a shorter time, 7.5%, or U.S.-born adults, 9%. Private insurance was the main source of coverage across all immigrant groups, except for the undocumented in California who were more likely to have public coverage. Uninsured immigrants naturally had less access to health care than the insured did. While 71% of U.S.-born adults reported Having made a visit to a doctor, only 50.5% of non-citizen immigrants who had been in the U.S. for over five years, and 44.2% of those in this country for five years or less, had seen a doctor. In addition, naturalized immigrants in both groups of non-citizen immigrants were less likely than native-born citizens to use an emergency room. The underuse of health care cannot be explained purely by the high percentage of immigrants who lack insurance, Bustamante says. Even if immigrants have insurance, they may not seek help from a doctor because they may not get paid for the time taken off from work. In addition, they may be unfamiliar with how the U.S. health care system works. If they don't speak English, they may not even be able to make an appointment. Partly due to restrictions on immigration, the immigrant population in the U.S. is aging and therefore subject to worsening health, the study notes. While only a small portion of immigrants are over 65 today, the process of immigrant aging is going to go really fast if the population of immigrants isn't replaced by continued flows of new immigrants, says Bustamante. The U.S. healthcare system is poorly prepared to take care of aging immigrants, according to the study. In most states, Legally authorized immigrants are subject to a five-year waiting period before they become eligible for Medicaid, and undocumented immigrants are ineligible for Medicaid and Medicare. Aging, documented immigrants may even find it challenging to qualify for Medicare because they need to account for at least 10 years of Social Security earnings to be eligible, the study says. Three of the states with the largest immigrant populations, Texas, Florida, and Georgia, severely restrict Medicaid coverage for immigrants, Bustamante says. In contrast, California, Illinois, and New York, which are also home to many immigrants, offer generous Medicaid coverage. In Illinois and California, there are proposals to cover some undocumented people. What will happen to aging, uninsured immigrants when they get sick? That's a big question, says Bustamante. A lot of the care will fall on their families, which are not necessarily high-income families. In some families, the younger people are citizens who will be called on to take care of their grandparents. This could limit the social mobility of U.S.-born family members. So that's interesting to look at and to consider how that worked and how that is working. Um, I'm not surprised. <clears throat> they, they talked about the U.S. lifestyle. And, uh, you know, I think that could have been expanded a little bit to include the eating of, of highly processed food, which is the majority of what you see when you go into the store. Um, I find it always very interesting to go shopping because I like to eat 
the freshest food that I possibly can. So back in the pre-COVID days, I used to go shopping like every two or three days, sometimes less than that, sometimes every single day. I would just, you know, come home from work or uh, leave work, go to the store, buy food for dinner and come home and make it. And um, this was to ensure that what I ate was as fresh as possible and uh, had not been processed in any particular way. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a very healthy person. I rarely ever get sick at all. But I know a lot of people that eat fast food and, and junk kind of food. And when I go to the store, there are just aisles and aisles and aisles that I never even bother to walk down because it's all packaged stuff in some way. You know, it's just a row after row of things in cans and boxes and <laughs> it could not exist in any kind of fresh state if it were just you know real food stuck in a box it, it has to be processed in some way to make it survive that kind of uh you know what an exposure that's not the right word <laughs> that kind of presentation you know the the ability to put food in a cardboard box and set it on a shelf for a long period of time is pretty much you have to take something out of the food or put something into it in order to make it survive that process. So I eat some frozen food, some frozen vegetables, and every now and then I'll get some canned vegetables. But everything else is fresh. And uh, when you eat that way, just which is, I guess is my main point, there are only just a couple of stops in the store. There's just it's like, Here's where the veggies are, the fresh vegetables. Here's where fresh meat and fish kind of thing is. Uh, here's where fresh sort of dairy-related stuff, cheese and whatnot, would be. Uh, here's frozen stuff, and that's kind of it. There's, there's nothing else that really uh, grabs your attention in the grocery store. And, and uh, while I may not be the most popular shopper because I'm not buying all that interesting, expensive... Uh, highly seasoned, highly processed stuff, uh, I am probably one of the healthier people that's there. Uh, so it's, I think, uh, just access to fresh food at some kind of affordable price is probably a really big deal. And it is probably a big part of the, the lack of access to that is probably a big part of the so-called American lifestyle or U.S. lifestyle that they're talking about because there are lots of places. I've been in lots of stores that, you know, they're fresh, like their fresh vegetable section is maybe a half an aisle of, you know, a couple shelves and that's it. Uh, you know, they have a meat department. It's sort of the same thing. You could just, you could pack it all into one aisle and that's all they have. You know, I go to a store that I chose because it has lots of fresh food, but um, there are lots and lots of stores and even in, you know, relatively affluent areas and very few stores in uh, the in poorer sections that have that sort of, uh, you know, that offer that sort of food for you. And um, it's very hard. It's very hard to find good food. I know that like when I've been traveling, I've used to have a really hard time. There was just only so much I could eat because everything is, you know, packaged or requires some sort of, you know, effort <laughs> that is not available to you when you're traveling. Um, so, yeah, finding just finding real food that you can eat is is a challenge and you have to know where to look and you have to have the luxury of being able to go around and look. So I think that's a, it's a big part of why people's health goes down. Anyway, neither here nor there. Just a, just a thought. So I'm going to move on. This is entitled, More Immigrants Moving to the Center of the U.S., Study Finds. I think that's interesting. Um, the study, conducted by Heartland Forward, a think tank based in Bentonville, Arkansas, found that the immigrant population increased by nearly 8% over the past decade in what's known as America's heartland, defined as a 20-state region in the center of the country spanning from Texas to Illinois to Alabama. 
Key findings of the report include the foreign-born population of the 20-state region has increased from 23.5% in 2010 to 31% in 2019. In the Northwest Arkansas metropolitan area, the immigrant population grew by 33% between 2010 and 2019. Tulsa, Oklahoma saw an increase in immigrant population by nearly 26% from 2010 to 2019, and Kansas City's immigrant population grew by about 21% in that time. Northwest Arkansas and Des Moines, Iowa are the homes of headquarters for some of the United States' largest companies. A large number of immigrants going to Des Moines in the last two decades were likely recruited and already had a college degree. Population growth has been slowing in the United States, meaning that more industries and companies are looking to immigrants to fill their workforces. According to a recent New York Times report, many states' populations would be shrinking if not for the influx of immigrants. We talked about this, I think, last week. Ross Duvall, president of and CEO of Heartland Forward, told Axios that this study counters the current perception that immigrants tend to stay on the coasts of the United States because they feel unwelcome in the center of the country. This could be part of the formula for fostering stronger job creation and growth overall in Heartland communities, said Duvall. Eldon Alec, Consul General of the Marshallese Consulate in Arkansas, said in the report that the shift in immigration could be attributed to a shared Christian faith. Additionally, the Pew Research Center found in 2017 that 55 percent of Muslims said that Americans are friendly toward them, helping immigrants assimilate more easily to their new community. However, while immigration to this central region of the United States is growing, rural areas are still struggling, found the report. Most immigrants are moving to big cities with better opportunities. There are some immigrants moving to rural areas for agriculture-based jobs, but the population is still declining. Looking ahead, the study concluded that further education for mayors, business leaders, and government officials about the benefits of immigration may help diversify communities in this region. Doing so could foster better job creation and growth within the center of the country. As we go forward, diversity and inclusion are not optimal, Ryan Sloan, president of the Nebraska Chamber of Commerce and Industry, said in a report. It's not something nice. It's fundamental to the economic development of our state. And here again, this is something that we've talked about a lot of times on this show, is just the number of small communities that are dying around, uh, well, the Midwest, I guess the heartland, you could call it, is incredible. I don't know how much you get out and drive around. I certainly don't do it as much as I used to. But, uh, you know, some time back, I used to travel pretty regularly around the Midwest. And, you know, there were lots of small towns and they were decent places in, in terms of population. You know, they were little communities. I wouldn't call them thriving necessarily, but they weren't dead. They were just small communities that just kind of coasting along. And that has changed in the last uh, couple of decades to the point where now, if you go around in a lot of these areas, a lot of these small towns are just functionally dead, I would say. They're, they're bedroom communities where people live there. But there's no, there may be a gas station like a Hux or one of those, you know, things where they, they sell a, a little snacks and food and, and whatnot and gas. And that's kind of it. There's like nothing else there. So it's hard to call these communities exactly. I mean, people do live there, but, you know, if you take away their access to larger cities and towns in their area where they go to a Walmart or one of these great big stores to get most of their stuff, uh, you know, these communities could not survive on their own because there's there's literally nothing there to, there's no commerce that exists there. It all takes place between people who live there and who go somewhere else to get stuff. So um, a lot of this could really be turned around by smart, forward-thinking uh, people who would say, hey, Okay, we've got this town, we have this infrastructure, we've got buildings, we have a downtown that's mostly empty, it now has like six bars and nothing else, 
and a bunch of empty buildings, we if we could attract people here to live here and start up businesses, um, specialty food stores, who knows what? Uh, you know, the immigrants are very entrepreneurial a lot of the time. They're just looking for a place to go. So you sell them a cheap house that's basically empty. You can rent them a cheap building to conduct their business in, which is just sitting empty. And you suddenly have people there and, and there's commerce there and there's something to do. There's some place to go to buy things. So people in the community will stop and shop there and that will earn them money and earn the owners of that money, uh, of that business money. God, I can't even talk sometimes. And, you know, and then they in turn will spend it in other places around town and, you know, they'll start up other businesses and people will come because they're relatives or friends or whatever. And these places will grow and they will be actual functioning communities again. It is entirely possible. There's no reason why that couldn't happen. It's just someone has to realize that that's a possibility and, and you have to get over the fact that a lot of the anti-immigrant sentiment that exists in this country is strongest in places where people know the least about immigrants, which tends to be places far away from where immigrants are, you know, currently living and working. So in big cities, people are like, immigrants? Sure, yeah. We, you know, my friends, relatives, my family, uh, my employer, my employees. Yeah, we know lots of immigrants. But in these small towns, it's like, ah, I never met those people. And it, it, there's, there's a reluctance there. So anyway, I think that could, that could change. And it should change, and I hope that it will change, because a lot of these towns deserve to be real towns again. There are people looking for safe places to live in the world, and there are places that could be really safe. Uh, you know, they're, they are really safe, and uh, all the stuff is there. It just needs people, it needs people to inhabit those places. Anyway, I'll move on. Uh, the next is from Politico. Uh, it's, it's, it's a source that I'm, I don't often go to, but sometimes I do. They're kind of up and down. But anyway, this is entitled GOP Donors Push Senators on Immigration. Let's see what happens here. So, putting on the pressure, a number of current and former GOP donors are taking aim at Republican senators, accusing them of picking partisan gamesmanship over good faith efforts to work on immigration reform. In particular, a group of Republicans who want to see progress on immigration reform negotiations are critical of Senator Lindsey Graham, who was originally in the 2013 Gang of Eight that sought to address the overloaded U.S. immigration system, and Senator John Cornyn, who represents a border state. They want Graham and Cornyn to press Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell to take up the Graham co-sponsored DREAM Act, the Farm Workforce Act, and Cornyn's own bill that he is co-sponsored with Democratic Senator Kirsten Sinema, titled the Bipartisan Border Solutions Act. GOP figures speaking out include board members of the American Business Immigration Coalition, who have spoken to 41 Republican senators about the bills. Some who describe themselves as lifelong Republicans say they may start voting across party lines if they don't see the party bend on immigration. Two Republicans who spoke to us threatened to withhold financial support. Cuban-American billionaire Mike Fernandez, a former Republican turned independent, who's previously donated millions to GOP candidates, and Bob Worsley, a former GOP state senator in Arizona. The people who have been there on the issue for a long time, like Lindsey Graham, are nowhere to be found at the moment, said John Rowe, Exelon Chairman Emeritus and National GOP Bundler. He doesn't particularly want to talk to me at the moment, and that, of course, is frustrating because I've supported him for a very long time. Rose said if Graham and Cornyn would put their muscle behind the existing bills alongside Democratic Senator Dick Durbin, he's confident they'd have 15 Republican votes. All I know is a whole lot of decent people are being held hostage to issues that don't have anything to do with them, Rose said. A spokesperson for Graham pointed out that the senator pointed out pointed to a statement the senator made in June in which he cited the situation at the border as the holdup on immigration reform, 
and Cornyn in a letter last week asked Durbin to mark up a targeted DACA bill in the Senate Judiciary Committee. But it's not just donors. Some figures with a different form of influence say they are fed up. William Diaz, a Venezuelan-American leader in Orlando who helped deliver Venezuelan support for Senator Rick Scott in 2018 against then-incumbent Bill Nelson, says he used to have meetings with Scott about immigration. Diaz, who is a registered Democrat, said he ultimately encouraged other Democratic Venezuelans to vote for Scott after multiple discussions about temporary protected status for Venezuelans. But Diaz says if Scott doesn't support key legislation he wants to see passed, he may encourage Venezuelan Americans to support other candidates next cycle. Scott's margin of victory was 10,033 votes, or 0.12%. Scott has vocally condemned the Venezuela authoritarian regime, even praising the Biden administration for granting TPS to Venezuelans fleeing the Maduro regime. He is also calling on Senator Marco Rubio. Some donors are also encouraging Democrats to simply go it alone through reconciliation on immigration if Republicans can't get on board. But this push is an uphill battle, at least right now. Republicans have been increasingly leaning further right on this issue, demanding big changes to border security, including building Trump's border wall, before they come to the negotiating table. And in further news, this is kind of, this is a whole different thing, but <laughs> the Free Britney movement has a new fan base, members of Congress. In light of Britney Spears' recent emotional plea before a judge to be released from her legal guardianship that is driving her crazy, lawmakers across the political spectrum, from GOP reps Matt Goetz and Andy Biggs to Dem Senators Elizabeth Warren and Bob Casey, are pushing for the federal government to take action. Okay, this has nothing to do with immigration. This is just a change of topic. <laughs> Apparently this... Is... Okay. We're just going to leave this alone because this goes on and on and it just goes, it talks about all sorts of other stuff. So anyway, there are people, excuse me, who are concerned about uh, the Republican Party's sort of hard right shift on immigration and they're making some efforts to change that. And I hope they're successful because there's, it didn't used to be this way. There didn't used to be such a huge difference on immigration. And it, that wasn't this uh, wedge issue or swing issue or whatever you call it. I don't know what the, the right term for it is, but it wasn't always this big, you know, you're either with this party and you're pro-immigration or you're with this party and you hate immigrants. You know, it didn't used to be this way and it doesn't have to be this way and it shouldn't be this way because there are pros and cons to uh, immigration reform and and welcoming of immigrants that are would and should appeal to members of both parties it it's it's well, anyway i don't want to blame trump entirely because the shift was going on before him but uh, a, over the years, I'll just put it this way, over the years, a number of people tending to be uh, in a certain party, who shall remain semi-nameless, uh, 